So my name is Harris Hamilton. I'm an optometrist that works in Boots Princess Street. I don't think I recognise any names, but give me a shout if I've tested your eyes before <laughs> in Boots Edinburgh Princess Street. Um, so the format of tonight is we're going to go through a few slides that gives a bit of information about um, your eye health and kind of the eye health of those that you love and the sort and some of the sorts of things that you can do to look after your eyes. I have been a qualified optometrist for just under four years now, and I've worked the entire duration of that in Boots, which is um, High Street Multiple Optician. And I met my wife, Laura, at university, um, down at a conference for eyes, very boringly. So I'll let Laura do her introduction now. All right, thank you. So yeah, my name's Laura, and I'm also an optometrist. I work in an independent practice um, just south of Edinburgh, um, so slightly different to where Harris is, but doing the same kind of job. And I mostly work on my own down there, and yeah, just love looking after everyone's eyes there. So hopefully we can tell you some useful things tonight. Yeah, so slightly different ends of the kind of spectrum mm -hmm. as far as optical work goes. So first of all, let's launch into our slides. Now, neither of us are at all technical wizards. <laughs> so, fine. Yeah, if, um, if anything goes awry, then please be forgiving. <laughs> now we want this one and share. Excellent, there we go. So great. Yeah, that all looks great. Everyone can see it. Yep. Brilliant. Now, if I click. There we go. So, big introduction over. Scottish community, I, I care. So, I was going to talk a bit about the setup in Scotland, how to access um, eye care, when to do it, and some more information along those lines. Okay, so in Scotland, your main protocol for anything eye related is to go and see your local optometrist. Um, so you can do that by contacting your local practice. Um, so to book an eye test, you can just give them a call or a lot of places offer online appointments. Um, so in Scotland, it's quite a good system here because the NHS actually fund all of the eye tests that are done. So you're entitled to a free NHS eye test every two years. Um, or if you're over 70, then that's every year. Um, or if you're over 60, then it can either be between one and two years. Um, or if you have certain conditions, if you're diabetic, you're also entitled to getting it a bit um, more frequently as well. Um, you don't have to wait the full two years, though, to get your eye tests, which is really good. Um, in Scotland, they do provide extra eye tests as well. So if you're having a problem with your eyes, um, if you feel like your vision's changed, or you have any eye-related problems at all, um, um, then your optometrist will see you. Um, so it's in the past, you used to go to your GP quite a lot for eye problems. And um, that's all changed now, though. So any eye problem at all, you go to your local optometrist is your first place to head to. Um, so I'm just looking at these little notes on here. So in, so yeah, like I said, in, the, in Scotland, it's all NHS funded, so you wouldn't really need to pay for your eye test. Um, and yeah. Anything yeah. else you want to add for that? <laughs> so talk through the, the process of it then. So what happens in your eye test? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, so in your eye test, if you're going for your normal routine eye test, um, there's certain things to expect. So you will go in and when you speak with your optometrist, you basically just answer a few questions about um, everything that's going on with your eyes, or if you have any problems, and that's the time to let your optometrist know what issues you're having. What having. Um, we'll also always ask you about your general health as well and medication. And um, that's a really important aspect of things because your medication um, and your general health does play a big impact on your eye health as well. And that question can sometimes catch people out because mm -hmm. people think we're talking about any eye related medication but in fact it's any medication so um, we'll come on to a few different topics later on of um, certain effects that medications can have in the eyes but one of those is um, a very common medication for menopause is um, HRT which one of the listed common side effects is dryness. So when the optician uh, asks if you're on any medication, it does mean anything at all that you're taking that's prescribed because um, you'd be surprised how many have some bearing and some effect on the eyes. If you look right down through their list of a million different side effects. 
Sorry, on you go. Yeah. Um, so after we found out a little bit more about you and your eyes and what's going on with them, we'll then move on to the eye test. Um, so for this part, we like to check your vision, seeing what you're seeing at the moment. And then we'll check what prescription you need for your glasses, um, which is an important part of the eye test. And in the past, um, historically, that's been the main part of the eye test really is checking what you can see and what glasses you need. And that's about it. Um, but now things have changed an awful lot. So there's a much bigger focus focus now on the health of your eyes as well and um, so we do lots of checks into how your eyes work together we check the pressure inside your eyes and um, because the pressure also is very important if the pressure is too high or too low in your eyes that can also cause damage to them and then we'll check um, inside the eyes as well and check the front surface of your eyes and just check everything um, is looking nice and healthy or if there's any changes um, and then usually we'll also do extra tests like taking photographs of your eyes um, and most practices in Scotland now can also take scans of your eyes. So we can do 3D scans that just show us a lot more information about your eyes. Um, but in the past, even you know, 10, 15 years ago, we wouldn't have been able to tell as easily about your eyes too. So the technologies really plays a big part in the eye tests as well now. Um, and we also do checks on your peripheral vision as well. Um, so if you've been to the, eye, the opticians, you might have done the clicky test where you're looking at flashing lights and things. Um, and that's also a really important one one too because that can also give us um, a lot more information about your eye health um, as well so those are the main things I think that yeah. we do as part of the eye test and everything that we're doing is the history and symptoms the questions at the start we then relate back uh, within the eye test and we tailor the specific nature of the testing to those questions so if at the start you say oh yeah my eyes are getting a bit gritty or sometimes they're sensitive to light or when I'm really tired I start to see double these are then going to launch into more specific tests later on and um, they look for the reason behind that. So most of what we're doing, especially in the routine kind of too early testing, is trying to see if we can make your life a little bit easier. If you can make you see better, if you can make your eyes healthier, or if we can take away any of the kind of day-to-day -day inconveniences that might be eye-related. A lot of them tend to have uh, very little in the way of kind of actual symptoms um, and you can have many eye conditions that actually can get progressively worse without really noticing it until it gets to quite a late stage. So that's the primary reason that the NHS in Scotland decided to take um, all of the eye care and, and fund it. So the recommendation is that even if you're having no problems, as of age four, you should be getting routine um, eye tests. So that brings us into our next section, children's eye care. So as um, I alluded to, you want to start thinking about um, your children and grandchildren getting their eyes tested around about age four. Now, Scotland has a really nice system where every single child, every single child will be screened within their nursery the year before they go to school and if they miss that appointment because they're off sick or um, this that or the other thing then they'll get sent a letter that then launches them into getting an eye test within a high street opticians and that's looking for any big sort of developmental changes in their eyes if one of them's really not working as it should or if there's um, any issues with the, the balance of the muscles in the eyes they're then able to pick them up at that early stage and then take them into the hospital care because luckily at that age there's very few things with the health of the eyes that are irreversible a lot within that period up to around about six or seven can be fully reversed and recover to completely perfect uh, 2020 eyesight so after that then it gets handed over if they've had no problems at that visit to us as community opticians, where any child from about the age of four or upwards can have normal yearly checks to make sure their eyes are developing within the kind of parameters that we'd expect. Although it is worth mentioning, if you are concerned about your child or grandchild's vision or any aspect of their eye health, they can be seen from practically three months upward. Um, it can be a handful looking after a three-month-old's um, eyes because obviously they don't want to cooperate too much, but there's still tests that we can do that give us an idea of what's happening um, within the health of their eyes. For children under the age of two, we tend to share the care with GPs, and that tends to be the main time that GPs are actively involved in the, the health care of the eyes is children that are younger than two years old. 
After that, then when they're getting their regular checks, we're looking for things like how well they can focus um, their 3D vision to make sure that they're grasping um, a high level of sort of binocular vision, meaning both their eyes looking towards the same target and they can focus and judge depths. And we're making sure that their eyesight is getting better year on year up to a sort of comfortable adult level, which tends to happen quite soon. Five or six, most children's eyesight will be fully developed. The sort of things that you can look out for, especially in very young children, are if they're blinking a lot more than they should be. And that can sometimes just be a habit that they've picked up, so don't be too worried. But sometimes it can be because their eyes are dry or because they're struggling to focus on things. Other things you should look out for is if you see a photograph of a child, a niece, a nephew, great nephew, anything like that, and one of their eyes has a white pupil, that can often be quite a worrying sign and that should be picked up and seen very quickly. The majority of the time it is just a kind of reflex flash of the camera, but in some very rare cases it can be a sign of cancer within the eye. And obviously the sooner that's picked up, the more effective they're going to be at managing that. And there's a few centres across the UK, one of which is Glasgow, that deal specifically with eye cancers. And um, some very, very highly trained professionals, ophthalmologists, ophthalmologists, nurses, and um, optometrists work in conjunction to look after the health of anyone's eyes that has uh, a cancer within the area. After that, um, the main thing that we're looking at with children is that their prescription is within a normal sort of range. So it should start off being a bit long sighted, which means that the focus is clear at distance and up close, but their eye muscles have to focus a little bit to see in the distance and then the normal amount to see up close and it gradually comes down to zero. The next thing that Laura will chat about is myopia, um, which is short-sightedness. Yeah, so short-sightedness is a really big problem amongst children now, so that's another reason it's really important to get children checked um, quickly. Um, I myself am very short-sighted, and that wasn't detected until I was eight years old, um, so if it had been picked up a little bit sooner, then they probably could have done a bit more when I was a child to um, help my eyesight now. But there is a lot of um, research that's been done and a lot of new treatment methods for short sightedness as well. Um, and that's really important for later life, too. Um, we'll come on to that as well. But if you're very short sighted, it does put you at higher risks of other eye conditions that will affect um, people later on. So things like um, macular degeneration and um, glaucoma and even retinal detachments. Um, can be a little bit more or a lot more common especially for retinal problems and um, if you're very short-sighted so getting that seen when children are young is quite important too. So one of the things that you can do um, as an adult in a child's life is you can encourage them to wear sunglasses from a young age. A really interesting statistic that, um, pardon the pun, but really opened my eyes was 80% of the UV damage done to our eyes throughout our entire life is before the age of 18. So things like cataracts, macular degeneration, all these conditions are much less likely if a child's routinely wearing sun protection from a young age. It's worth mentioning as well that in the um, days before sort of fancy coatings and lenses, a tint would be the only way to actually prevent the sun damage. But there are now lenses that can be completely transparent that offer a full UV protection. So you can ask your opticians about that. And if you know a young person that is wearing um, glasses on a regular basis, because even on cloudy days, you can still get a lot of UV coming through the atmosphere. You can have a chat with them about saying this is uh, going to be useful for you later on or talking to their parents or if it's your child talking to you're showing them, sort of showing them the benefits of having something that's going to protect their eyes a little bit. And as well as correcting the eyesight, it can actually look after the health of the eyes. And still important as an adult as well to think about UV protection too. Exactly, yeah. So <laughs> it's the one thing that we can make a massive difference on in controlling the actual health of our eyes is UV protection. <laughs> Along with that is diet. Having a sort of healthy, balanced diet, particularly high in leafy green vegetables, can be really good for preventing some eye conditions. And... Uh, regular exercise and hydration is good for um, dryness in the eyes as well, which let's, yeah, let's, let's go in order. Let's go in order here. So on a misconception, <laughs> now we had a little list somewhere um, of common misconceptions. Might be quite near the bottom of my list. Can I, can I ask a quick question, guys? Of course. Paul, Pauline here. Um, I uh, I wondered uh, how, when you said uh, very short-sighted, 
How how short sighted do you class very short sighted as? Good question. So it depends really, but for me, I'm around a minus, well, between a minus six and a minus seven. Mm -hmm. um, the highest prescription I've ever seen was a minus 15. Mm -hmm. um, so that was extremely short sighted. Well, that's so minus say, 15 out of 20, yeah? Yeah, well, yes, yeah, so I was like around, you wouldn't expect to see much higher. The world, that, yeah. the, the highest prescription glasses ever made were minus 108. So if wow. anyone feels that they're <laughs> very short sighted or they feel they've got bad eyesight, at least you're not minus 108. That makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but anything over, I say your risk for things like retinal detachment grows up a lot after you're about a minus four, I think. And mm -hmm. um, so once you kind of pass a minus four, that is when the risk kind of increases quite a lot. Um, so I say up to about a minus two, it's quite low myopia or short sightedness. Um, and then between a two and a four, moderate, and then kind of higher after after that. Yeah. And does yeah. that increase with age or as well as 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 because obviously you're if if you're like me, my eyes have deteriorated. Um so so you know, does it does the apart from your your prescription increasing, does the risk of the of the retinal detachment and uh, other things increase as well yes mainly less yes but well, yes it does actually for everything so with retinal detachments with age you're more likely to have a detachment of the jelly inside the eyes so that's age can cause that to happen so um i'm sure it's happened to quite a lot of you when you get new floaters that's all to do yeah. with the jelly in the eye and um, so as that changes with age that also increases the risk of a retinal detachment and then most of the other conditions so cataract is mainly an age related thing too um and glaucoma and macular degeneration is generally called age related macular degeneration so sadly the majority of of these eye conditions are all um worsened by age yeah yeah i'd like to say great but i'm not great <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so one interesting thing is quite often um people think of an increase in their prescription as a deterioration in their eyesight and although there's truth to that that it does put you at slightly higher risk of some eye conditions that in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean that your eyes are getting any less healthy. So don't be too worried if you go to the opticians and they tell you that your prescriptions changed by 0.75 or whatever it might be, because a lot of the time the eyes are still very healthy. It's just that the actual size of the eyeball has changed or the thickness of the lens that's focusing the light has changed. And that's had a knock on impact. The eye is such a finely tuned organ that even the tiniest difference, any part of it can affect where the light's going to be focusing at the back of your eyes. And mm -hmm. um, the other thing not to be worried about is astigmatism. So a lot of people are a bit in the dark about what astigmatism is and think it might be some sort of disease or something like that. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you will know what it is, but uh, to not patronize, um, it is when the eyeball, rather than having a completely rounded shape, has a slightly rugby ball shaped um, sort of overall curve to it. So one direction is a bit longer than the other. And it means that light focuses at two different places at the back of the eye one may be sharp or neither of them may be sharp and to correct that you just have lenses that are slightly thick in one direction than the other and it combines it all together so astigmatism is not a disease it's just like being long or short-sighted that needs correction with glasses contact lenses or laser eye surgery and astigmatism um, can change throughout as well, just just like your prescription changes exactly yeah. and if you ever look at your prescription you'll see there's three different sections to it there is the sphere which is how long or short-sighted you are there is the sill or syl that is how much astigmatism you have and then there's the axis and that's the angle that the astigmatism's at so you could sometimes look at it and your axis has changed from five to 95 and you'd think oh my gosh, I am going to go blind. Um, but that's purely just the angle is changing. So it's not actually any worse than it was before. It's just a different angle. So sometimes your prescription can stay the same, but need new glasses because there's been a change to the axis if you've got a high level of astigmatism. Yeah. Now, the other misconception is that wearing glasses is bad for you. Miss um, can be the case in very, very few scenarios. So if you're a little bit long-sighted and you're very young, Sometimes it can reduce the effect of the muscles in the eyes, but for the vast, vast majority of people, wearing glasses is purely an accessory and a tool. So it just corrects the eyesight when they're in front. And as soon as you take them off, the eyesight's the same as it would have been before you put them on. The one thing that can sometimes confuse people with that is if you have previously not been wearing any glasses and you've got pretty poor eyesight, but you're going about your life relatively fine. 
and then you suddenly put glasses on you'll suddenly realize what good vision actually feels like and then you take glasses back on back off and you've now realized that what you thought was a 10 out of 10 vision is actually a 7 out of 10 and this is what 10 out of 10 should feel like so you've got a bigger comparison between kind of with and without and it makes it feel like your eyesight's got worse because of using them Mm -hmm. now the next thing we'll talk about is presbyopia so this is a process that happens roughly in sort of mid 40s to uh, early 50s and it tends to affect different ethnicities at different times African uh, origin uh, African ethnicities tend to be affected a little bit early in their life and then Asians tend to be a little bit later Caucasians it tends to average around about age 47 and um, 48 that sort of ballpark and it's not that um, the muscles in the eyes are getting any weaker mm-hmm. oh yes <laughs> it's the reading is the what some people would call the long sightedness that happens in the sort of midlife yeah you start to need reading glasses or different glasses for reading yeah Mm-hmm. and <laughs> it, 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 yes thank you there's the jargon slipping in again <laughs> it tends to be because the uh, lens inside the eye is getting slightly thicker and therefore it's harder for the muscles to pull it what also tends to be the case is the muscles aren't really any noticeably less um strong than they were before because people think it's that that the eye muscles are getting tired and they're getting weaker they tend to be just as strong but the lens is getting thicker pretty much every year of your life it's it's most flexible at age 12 when it can focus right up close and then every year after that it gets a little bit worse so even Beth is on the wrong side of this one guys <laughs> <laughs> but it starts to affect you around about 45 because that's when the area that you can focus on kind of comes in line with where you'd want to be holding something to read and they've just not got the flexibility within that lens so simple reading glasses or very focals help with that so now we've got a little bit on dry eyes where did we go with that yeah so dry eyes affect um lots of people and Laura both chat through some of the medication that can cause that and some of the things that you can do in your life to mitigate the symptoms of them yeah so with dry eyes a lot of hormonal medications will affect um, this so things like HRT and um, birth control things like that so um, it's really that's why it's really important to let your optometrist know what medication you are taking um, any other medications you can think of to add <laughs> um, some antihistamines mm-hmm. can also do so this time of year especially people are taking a lot of antihistamines mm-hmm. and you can notice that the eyes feel itchy and irritated and you take antihistamines and they feel itchy and irritated because your eyes are dry <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, so dry eyes can present in a few different ways. Um, so they can feel physically dry, they can feel gritty or burning. Um, and another symptom of dry eyes is actually watery eyes. Um, so this is really common. We get people coming in and say, oh, my eyes are so watery. I don't know why. And then you have a look and you see that they're very dry. And then you tell them they're very dry. And they're like, oh, what? they're so wet. They can't be dry. Um, but this is actually a, a product of the dryness. So when your eyes get dry, the front surface of your eye becomes so exposed to everything. So if it is windy or if you've got the heating on or air conditioning anything that comes near your eyes your eyes won't like it and then they just tend to pump out a lot of extra water then to compensate for that um, and they just tend to overproduce that watery part so that's why your eyes get really watery and mm-hmm. um, but because it obviously spills out of your eyes it's not actually helping with the dryness and um, so that's why you then need to get treatment to help with that um, and dry eyes we see that all the time with with eye tests so um, that's definitely one that will, would be picked up on, on your normal eye test and we can advise you then on how to treat it but generally it depends what's causing the issue but most of the time it would either be using um eye drops or eye ointments into your eye or if there's other issues so the blepharitis that we've got there that's an inflammation along your eyelids and um, so if that happens again there's things to do like cleaning your eyelids or getting heat onto your eyelids as well that can all help um treat blepharitis and that would in turn then help with dry eyes as well um, but there are so many different types of dry eyes and treatments for it as well so um then your optician would be able to kind of advise you on specific treatments for that as well mm-hmm. right. so the next thing that would be important to go over is some of the common eye emergencies that we see what you should be looking out for and um what you can do if you do experience any of these symptoms so if you do experience any sort of red eye and it's associated particularly with 
a light sensitivity, so sore to look up to natural light or fluorescent lights indoors, or there is a headache in that area or pain associated with it, then you should phone up your local optician or the optician that you've previously been to if you've got a um, an existing optician because they'll have all your previous record cards. They're much easier. It's much easier to know what is normal for you and what's not normal for you if they've got a history of um, what your eyes look like in the past. So a lot of opticians will now operate a triaging system where you can phone up, they'll ask you a few questions and um, they'll bring up your previous record cards. And from that, they can allocate you an appointment to make sure that you're seen within a sort of sensible time frame, dependent on the symptoms. So as I work in Boots, it's a, a big company. We've got a forum that we go through. And if we have a lot of um, spaces, then we'll go to see straight away. And if not, then we have a look through the other appointments we've got in the day and we prioritise which ones are needing to be seen today. And if there's things that are very routine and we get someone phoning in with the emergency, then we would um, kindly ask the person if they would mind rescheduling so that we can accommodate the emergency. A lot of the time, the emergencies will involve contact lenses because by having a piece of um, very soft plastic in the eye, it does put a little bit more strain on the front surface and it lets bacteria have a more sort of warm environment um, to, to grow. So you can get more bacterial infections and viral infections and less commonly in this country, but fungal infections as well um, caused by contact lenses. So the best way to mitigate that is just being very sensible with the contact lens use, making sure you're always washing your hands before you put them in and uh, before you take them out and avoiding sleeping in them, including naps and um, any contact with water also raises the chance of introducing a viral infection into the eyes. So making sure that you're not wearing them when you're showering or if you have a little swim after the gym, taking them out before you go in to do that as well. Other common forms of uh, emergency that we see would be flash medicine floaters. You want to talk a little bit through that? Yeah, so the kind of worrying thing about that would be retinal detachment, as we've mentioned. So um, this is where the layer that goes around the back of your eye, that can kind of start to fall away from the eye or it can tear. Um, and if that happens, that can really damage your eyesight. So that is something that would normally need to either have laser treatment or to be operated on really quickly. Um, so the main things to look out for for this are if you get any sudden increase in new floaters. So they're the little dark specks that float around in your eyes. If you see those all of a sudden, in, or if you start to get any flashing lights, so particularly bright white flashing lights in one particular area of your eye, um, or if you see any dark shadows or kind of curtains coming over any, any of your vision, and um, anything strange like that at all, you should always con contact your optometrist straight away. Um, as soon as you mention new flashes, new floaters, they'll know that that's something to prioritise, um, and that's always something we'd like to see on the same day. Um, so when, if that happens, you would come into your optician and we would put dilating eye drops in to make your pupils bigger. And then we get a better view of everything at the back of your eyes and we can check and see how your retina looks. Um, the majority of the time, it won't actually be a retinal detachment. So like I mentioned before, the jelly inside the eyes, sometimes that changes and that happens quite commonly as we get a little bit older or if you are more short sighted, you're also at higher risk of that. So if that happens, that can also give you new floaters and flashing lights, but that's not a problem that's quite normal for that to happen but there is the risk of the problem with the retina so that's why it's always good to get that checked straight away yeah it's definitely a safe bet to always bring some sunglasses along to your appointment if you've got any emergency system uh, any emergency symptoms or if you are over 60 because in scotland the norm is to use dilating eye drops and um, to get a better view of all the wee nooks and crannies at the back of the eye and um, the other one that i'd say is particularly uh, good to look out for in scotland just because of our genetic pool, we tend to have smaller eyes uh, and it means that there's more long sighted people in Scotland um, and the rest of the UK than there are in countries like China, for example. And that means that a few of the structures are a bit more squished together. Now, one of the ways that this can become an eye emergency is at the front, there's fluid that circulates through our eye all day and it gets produced from behind the pupil and it exits out between where the white of your eye meets the iris. And that drainage angle is very important because if it starts to close, then the pressure can raise. And if it is completely closed, the pressure can raise very, very quickly. And what you'd feel with that would be a very 
painful eye with a headache you might get some halos around lights which is another symptom to look out for and it would be red and again that's something that's important to see straight away now laura what would we do if you get any of these sort of uh, emergency symptoms and your optician is closed but it's a saturday if it's so it's yeah saturday yeah, so you could try um, other practices if they're open on the Saturday, so check the opening hours of other places, um, or if it is when all practices are closed, so if it's later in the evening or you can't get an appointment anywhere else, you can always contact NHS 111, so the Out of Hours Service. Um, they're really good and they would be able to also point you in the right direction or get you an appointment somewhere um, if you're having problems when your, your normal practice is closed. Mm -hmm. cool. One thing that Laura touched on a bit earlier, and um, it's been a massive difference to how we look after people's eyes in practice is optical coherence tomography. And we use the term OCT from here on out because that's what it's normally <laughs> referred to. And um, this is a 3D scanner that looks through all of the layers of the retina and lets us have a look much deeper into the eye to see if there's any problems. And it can often give us a very early insight into the starts of eye conditions, such as macular degeneration and glaucoma at stages that are very early and with quite a few of the conditions that's, conditions that it's picking up, it's early enough to actually nip it in the bud and stop it from worsening, um, or at least leave it at a much healthier level. So if you are getting an eye test and the optician says that you can have an OCT, often, because it's not an NHS-funded test, there'll be a small fee for it. But if it's something that you can afford, it's well worth considering because it does give them a whole lot more information, kind of akin to getting the x-rays done at the dentist it's not really a requirement, but best to do it because they can actually see what's going on under the surface rather than trying to infer what's happening just from the symptoms and the kind of look from the outside. So we've compiled together a few photographs and a few of these OCT scans. So on the top there, you see my lovely wife's retinas. That's the back of her eyes. Um, I did her eye test just two weeks ago, was it? Um, and let's have another look, make sure I've not missed anything. Nope, they look quite healthy. <laughs> so when we see these photographs, they are part of the NHS test. So anytime you get your eyes tested for a regular check, um, as long as it's not sort of outside of the eye emergency, we'll probably be taking these photographs for you. And they're really useful because they give us a view at the smallest blood vessels that are visible anywhere in your body. Now, one of the, uh, the facts of life is that women live longer. And because of that, tends to be that more of the age-related conditions will happen to women than happen to men. And there are a few that just have a genetic disposition towards women rather than men as well. So looking at the back of the eyes gives a great insight into overall general health, but also um, specifically the eye conditions. So if we have a look at these photos we've got of Laura's, I'll talk through the structures that you see, because you'll have probably seen the photographs flick up in an eye test before we might not really know what's going on with them so of course we can see the blood vessels we know what they are the darker ones are the arteries and the lighter ones are the veins is that right no nope. nope. <laughs> laura will tell you what they are so the veins are the darker ones <laughs> there we go and um, so oh there we go little brain farts and um, and then the sort of light sun-like orbs that you see are the optic nerves so technically speaking that is a part of the brain and that takes the image from the central eyesight and all of the peripheral vision it bundles it together and it sends it upside down back to front back to the brain and um, where it then gets processed into the world that you see some people that are amblyopic or as most people would know it have a lazy eye the eye is very healthy but once it gets to the brain it's not receiving the signal so it looks on the surface like everything's working well, but because of something as a child that um, the vision's not been as good, it's not quite created the links in the brain to actually allow clear vision. The dark spot within the middle of the photograph is the macula. So that's where all the detailed light is focused to give you a really sharp view of whatever it is that you're looking directly towards. And beneath the two photographs, we see one of these 3D scans. And what we're looking at is a side view um, effectively taking a cake slice through the retina and looking at all the different layers in great detail. And that's my one, I believe, um, that we're looking at there, which isn't quite as healthy as Laura's, but it's okay for the time being. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And the little dip in the center is kind of like a satellite dish to focus as much light as possible within that central part. So that's a rough idea of what normal looks like within that. And then what we're going to show you now is a few of the abnormals. Mm -hmm. So to the patient, Laura. Yeah, this is a lady I saw uh, a few years ago now, but she came in and her main complaint was new flashing lights and a few floaters and then just a slightly dark area in her vision she was a bit um, confused about. So she came in and this is the back of her left eye here. And um, so for this one, she'd had a really big retinal detachment. So that's what the line is that's going across the photograph. So that's kind of the edge of where it had come to. Um, and she was extremely lucky because this has just reached the edge of where her macula is. So you can still see the slightly darker bit in the middle there. And um, so she was very fortunate. She went off to the eye hospital the same day and they did surgery for her straight away um, and I saw her back a few months ago and her vision was amazing again so they'd really done a good job at um, fixing the back of her eye but if she had left it much longer if she hadn't come in to see me and um, if this had detached even further then the chances of her getting her vision back would have been a lot lower than they were so um, she did a good job in coming in to see me nice and quickly. <laughs> yeah and that's it I think the very classic British way is to sort of not bother anyone and wait and see if things will get better on their own with your eyes you've got to take it very seriously any sort of changes just pick up the phone because mm -hmm. chatting it through with your practice who's as I say probably able to triage it can give you an idea of if it is something that's worth doing something about or they can reassure you say no that's absolutely fine and um, you're good to go and then we'll just do a routine check for you when you're due next mm -hmm. so in this case as Laura said earlier as soon as you know if you say the words flashing lights or floaters or a veil over your vision you're going to be whipped into our testing chair and then sent straight up to the hospital if it is a detachment like this mm -hmm. it's worth mentioning um, anecdotally from our experience people that have flashing lights of voters only about one of a hundred actually have a detachment or a tear mm -hmm. the majority tend to be the jelly changes at the back that just cause the normal floaters that laura was chatting about earlier mm -hmm. so don't panic but do act promptly yeah and um, now, then on to child eye care. So routine checks are very, very important because children um, aren't as good at talking about their problems or um, putting them into words as adults are, of course. So they can't quite um, tell you exactly what's going wrong, especially if they're younger. But even as they get older, if they're sort of teenage years, then um, it might not be that they can't do it. It's just they don't want to tell you about anything that's going on in their lives. So these pictures are from a girl that I saw when I was in my final year of training. And for the last six months, she'd had sort of blurry vision. And occasionally we should see things and they kind of dip in and out of focus. They'd go into two separate images. And what you're looking at here is the nerves. But if we compare them to Laura's nerves, the keen eyes amongst you would know that the nerve there has a very, very sharp line between where the nerve is, that lighter part, and where the retina is, the more orangey part. Mm -hmm. And here, it's a bit more of a kind of gradient. And what that tells us is alarm bells, again, because in this case, the little girl that I saw, the double vision was happening because one of the nerves that controls the muscles in the eyes was getting pressed from the brain, and it was actually suppressing it so that the muscles couldn't work. And this girl had hydrocephalus, um, which is a very nasty condition of increased pressure within the brain, which left unchecked can actually be fatal. Mm -hmm. So this was another one that I picked up the phone straight away and sent her up to sick kids. And she actually had to get a um, lumbar. lumbar puncture to drain some of the fluid out of her brain. And immediately after they did that, her eyesight was back to normal, exactly mm -hmm. like it was before. So again this was a 12 year old girl she just kind of mentioned in passing to her parents that she'd been having some problems which wasn't quite due for her check I think she had had one six months ago another six months until she would have been due but they thankfully listened to her and they brought her in for a checkup and in that case the parents bringing her in and actually saved her life and um, so it shows you that not only is the eye test about the glasses it really is about looking after the health of yours and your loved one's eyes mm -hmm. this one here uh, it's another lady that I saw quite recently and um, she worked in a very stressful job, um, very high position job, very high octane. And this is a condition that, in fact, is more common in men, but happens typically to people that are stressed. And it's called central serous retinopathy, CSR for sure. Again, we'll move the jargon out of the way. But effectively, some people have a 
slightly abnormal response to cortisol, which is the stress hormone, and it causes fluid to leak at the back of their eye and build up. And what you see there on the little side view at the top, that black sort of pool at the bottom in between the different layers of the lighter part of the retina is actually fluid that has accumulated under the middle of her eye. And it was pushing the, the back part of her eye up the way, causing her vision to be a bit distorted and a bit blurred. So what typically happens for these patients is that you advise them to try and do what's in their control to mitigate stress and get good sleep and try and emphasize the focus on work-life balance. Um, ultimately, a lot of the time you have to refer them up to the hospital for them to review to see if they need to have any injections, if it's going to have a permanent effect on their vision. But actually, quite a lot of the time, it will just resolve by itself. It will reabsorb and then the vision tends to be pretty good afterwards. Can I ask a wee question about that one, Harris? Absolutely. If th this woman, if she didn't get the OCT scan, so she didn't get the 3D scan, how easy would it have been for you to just identify it with just the normal retinal photos? So it's significantly easier with. It's not impossible by any means to see it, but the photographs at the bottom, the two photographs that you see, one is the eye that has this and one is the eye that doesn't have it. And even to myself and Laura, trained professionals, it's quite difficult to spot which one it is. It's the one that you see on the right of the screen, which is her left eye. And um, you might have thought that it was the slightly lighter part on the one on the left of the screen. But yeah, it's the one down there on the right. There's just a slight difference in the colouring of the middle. And that's really all you'd see um, without the 3D scans. So the 3D scans are the thing that can really harness this for us. Sometimes they don't have the distortion in these sorts of conditions. And it's just that the prescription feels a bit worse. And there's a change because that area has moved up a little bit. And in those cases, historically, it probably was lost. It, sorry, not lost. Historically, it was probably missed fairly regularly um, but as I say because there are things that you can do within your lifestyle to affect the chance of getting better rather than worse it's important that it is picked up and uh, the 3D scan is the best way for us to do that. Thank you. Yeah. And so this one's also post-cataract CMO so CMO um, is cystoid macular edema, which just means there is, again, fluid that builds up at the macula. Um, so this can happen relatively commonly after having cataract surgery done. Um, so what can happen is because your eye has an inflammatory response during surgery, sometimes you can be left with this happening at the macula at the back of the eye. Um, so this gives some similar sorts of symptoms to having macular degeneration, although it is a bit different. But when you have um, cataract surgery done, it's really important that you come back to see your own optometrist normally about five or six weeks after you've had surgery um, and at this point we would check what your vision is like and how your eyes responded to having the surgery um, and again the OCT scans are really useful for detecting this as well and um, because it just shows that so obviously if there is a problem at the back of the eye or if everything has gone really well and um, so certainly if you have cataract surgery done um, make sure you go back and see your optician and if you do have the surgery and you feel like anything's not quite right afterwards or you have any problems then again always best to give us a call um, and chat things through and then other things that an eye test can pick up that not many people know about is you can actually get freckles in the back of your eye so if you look on the color photograph in the top left there you'll see that there is the darker bit which is the macula and then down below that and um, there is the sort of brown area that is a freckle just like you'd get anywhere in your skin most of the time, these are completely harmless, but in a small percentage of cases, they can be cancerous. So it's important that your optician gets a chance to look at them and then reviews them to make sure they're not changing. Um, and there's a few things that we look out for when we're reviewing those to see if they look dangerous or not. And this one looks very much like a normal just freckle uh, at the back of the eye. <laughs> So this is um, age-related macular degeneration, uh, significantly more common in women. And although at the moment with this kind that we see here, which is called dry macular degeneration, there is no cure for it. There are things, again, lifestyle-wise that you can do to mitigate your risk. So in the mild to moderate cases of it, there's some supplements that you can take that actually will help the overall health of the 
retina and therefore stop the macular degeneration progressing at a fast rate and slow down the rate of change that contain lutein in them. Um, again, it's important to speak to your optician to get specific tailored advice on what's going to be the right solution for you because the supplements will not work for everybody. They will work for some that are in a specific stage and it's specific supplements and there's lots of available and it's difficult to sort of find your way through what's good and what's not without guidance from a professional that knows your eyes. But the signs to look out for with this are just slow changes to the quality of your vision. And if you have macular degeneration, that's the dry kind, which we see here, and you're not receiving any treatment, it's important to keep track of if you're seeing any distortion. So your optician might give you a little grid to check with one at a time or to look at a door one at a time to see if lines look straight. And if they don't, then it's important to, again, get a very quick eye test done to make sure that it's not started to leak. Because sometimes in more advanced stages of macular degeneration, it can start leaking which does have a management, but unfortunately the management is just to prevent it from getting worse again at a faster rate rather than to stop it, prevent it, to stop it from getting worse. And that is in the form of eye injections, which sounds pretty horrible, but um, you're looking off to the side and you really don't feel anything happening apart from a little bit of pressure, uh, as all my patients that have had them tell me. So can I, can I just get you to go back to that slide, please, Harrod? Yes. Uh, and then... So, so basically, we're looking at the, the 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 white area of the bumpier area, yeah. Keen eye, correct. So, that, and, and that, so that so that that whole white area is that the whole the whole bit of that is that macular or is the macular? So the macular is the fact that it's irregular, that it goes up and down, and there are just accumulations that have happened through years of oxygen nutrients being brought into the eye and then taken out of the eye through the blood vessels. And some of that, a small percentage will get left over each time in some people that start to accumulate. And uh, that's what we're seeing those lumps and bumps. They're called mm -hmm. drusen. Right. And they can affect the eyesight um, and start to cause um, cell death above it, which then uh, worsens the eyesight further. Yeah. And again, picking that up early means that you can then set in place the lifestyle changes like keeping a healthy, balanced diet. UV protection and then um, stopping smoking yeah, if you're a smoker because that makes a massive difference to your likelihood of getting it. Yeah. And can can you just talk for a second about the, the lines? Because I thought the wonky lines was due to astigmatism. So within, if we go back to the photograph, the, the scan on the top right there mm -hmm. is a normal healthy one. And um, that one I think is Laura's eyes and Laura has got a reasonable amount of astigmatism so as you can see the astigmatism doesn't actually affect the back of the eye it's more to mm -hmm. do with the, the front oh sorry the, do you mean my apologies you meant the grid that I was talking about yeah just just when you were talking about the looking at a door because I thought yes sorry 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 so yeah the, the lumps and bumps in there then um because it's a deviation from the straight line that we'd have yes. back normally it causes distortion in our vision because rather than the light hitting a flat surface it's hitting yeah. a bumpy surface yeah. so it's getting the signals are getting mixed up as they go to our brain effectively yeah so mm -hmm. with astigmatism your glasses if you wear glasses would correct that so if you have your glasses on you shouldn't notice any kind of yeah. blurriness or waviness but if you have your glasses on and things do look distorted so if you're looking at tiles or door frames and they're looking a bit wobbly or things like that then that's more likely to be um something else unless your glasses are really out of date <laughs> yeah. yeah or contact lenses same thing for contacts They'll correct, yeah, they'll correct astigmatism um, for most people as well, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is um, another person's eye that looks quite dramatically different from the normal. Mm -hmm. What we're actually seeing here is a lady um, who is in her late 50s and has had type 2 diabetes since she was about 20 years old. She's controlled it very well and she monitors her diet, but unfortunately, even with very good control, diabetes does tend to eventually take some effect. This is a very extreme example of that, but looking after your diet is the best way to mitigate how um, much effect the um how much the diabetes is going to affect the eye. So what you'll see here is that if you look at the scan, the different um, black and white on the, the right there, one side's a lot thicker than the other. And that's just because there's a lot of the cells that have started to die off because of damage to the blood vessels and a reduced supply of oxygen and nutrients to that part of the eye from the diabetes. Um, and as I say, very much not through any fault of her, just by 
process of how long uh, she's had the diabetes. So the best thing that we can do is to keep a healthy balanced diet before developing diabetes to prevent our chance of getting it. And then once you've got diabetes, taking very careful care of it, making sure that you're always taking your medication, whether it's type two and you get something like metformin or type one, you have to take uh, injections if you've had it for um, the sort of entirety of your life. But then the symptoms to look out for here would be kind of patchiness to the vision or fluctuations in your vision um, or flashing lights or floating objects can sometimes be an effect here. What you're seeing around the outside in the photographs, the uh, lighter colouring is scars from where there's been previous damage um, to the retina. And I believe in this lady, it might not be quite visible in the photographs, but she also had um, some treatments to try and stop some of the leaky blood vessels at the back of her eyes leaking so much, mm. which was done with a, a laser to try and stop them um, in their tracks and cut them off. Mm -hmm. And diabetes can also be picked up in an eye test as well. So um, if we ever look at your eyes and think, oh, there's maybe a few little leaky blood vessels or any extra deposits that shouldn't be there. And um, if there's anything unusual like that, we'd normally recommend for you to go and see a GP and get a few checks done. So um, that can be picked up. And same for high blood pressure and high cholesterol and um, things like that can also be detected through an eye test too. So um, another reason to go for them regularly. Mm -hmm. so, this is about on time and um, general top tips and summary. Um, the main take homes are make sure that you're getting your eyes tested on a regular basis and sooner if you start to notice any issues or at least contacting your optician. And sunglasses are a big thing for me as well. So although a lot of sun damage can be done earlier in life, it's still really important to always make sure you wear sunglasses, although we don't get a lot of sun in Scotland, but sometimes we do. And even if it's not a particularly bright day, there still can be UV um, kind of hanging around. So good to make sure you always wear sunglasses and make sure everyone in your family wears them as well, or a hat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 